It's the 5th of September at 8.14 and I'm now about to give you my video seminar for the hospital seminar on my life story and the teachings of a new wave of medicinal use of cannabis. So, hello, I'll start off. And my name's James Bevan. I'm thankfully, due to cannabis and willpower alone, I'm proud to be stood here alive to tell you all my life story and what I've learned about this little known healing qualities of this special plant and how it has saved my life for the last 20 years. I really think this needs to be done and I'd love to be the person to do it as I actually have a story to tell on the subject as it's saving my life and I just have a can of butter now instead of smoking it to be allowed to have it on the ward in the Ipswich Hospital. So my aim, once better or even before if it can be organised quickly enough, I'd like to do the seminar slash video seminar for you all. These are the points I'll be covering, but in no particular order. So number one, an introduction to myself, my life story, telling you of my battling cancer for the last 20 years. Number two, to explain the fact it is now being medically supplied legally from dispensaries and pharmacies and doctors across and clinics likewise across the country. Number three, to explain about the endocannabinoid system and uh, doc the, the doctor's findings from 1966 and onwards about it and how it works. Number four, to show a short video of Dr. Christine Sanchez to show her advances with cannabis and cancer back in the 90s. I believe 1992. Number five, just educate so nobody gets treated in the same manner that I've been treated in this day from 3rd of August to this date today that I'm doing this seminar. Number six, to be able to read you a poem that I wrote about people that work under doctors in the hospital called to the unsung heroes and it's a poem to show my thanks to everyone that doesn't get shown appreciation for in the background so before i tell you of my mythical like story i'd like i'd just like to, you to know that i'm not a doctor or a clinician in any way shape or form but what i am is p part living proof of why cannabis is now legally prescribed today no more did I think I would be scrutinised for the medical use of this magical healing herb as I now hold a legal prescription and I believe my purpose in life is to pass my story and knowledge on to help educate hopefully not just Ipswich Hospital but hopefully those of our whole nation through this video and this seminar. It's in the Bible, in 20 or so verses, yet we don't get taught that in church. It's also in there for 12 different uses, one of them being healing. I'm not religious, but in the book of Matthew, of some sect of Christianity, it states that any preacher of mine that doesn't preach the healing powers of this plant of mine is no priest of mine, or a very similar wording. Now, we don't get taught that in church, and no church I know of has ever preached the verses I've read. But I'm not here to give you a religious sermon, but I am here to preach to you the powers of this magical and natural herbal chemo, its anti-tumor effects being a massive preventative for cancer, amongst so many other medical uses. Much less harmful than the chemicals that nearly killed me. 
I believe not just Ipswich hospitals, but hospitals nationwide are going to have a massive influx of patients, just the same as myself, who smoke it, take the oils or eat it, because you can take it orally in any way, shape or form, all of which help in different ways for different pains. The best place for me to start is to explain the EC system or the endocannabinoid system, which was founded, I believe, in the 1970s by an Iranian doctor. He found that every, every person has an EC system receptor within their brains, every living person on this planet, so which is a receptor that produces a lot of the same cannabinoids found within the plant when you smoke it, or ingest it, or whichever way you take it. This is cannabis. If, we're in, if we are not in pain, users generally get higher from it than if people who are ill and need the system refilling constantly, like myself, from orally taking cannabis in any form to fight, help fight pain or do whatever it needs to do, i.e. helping people with epilepsy, MS, even people with ME, as well as cancer like myself and so many other health problems. Whereas someone without pain has their receptors full all the time, hence why they get higher usually easier than people that are in pain. Although like all medications, you need to give yourself time to get used to what side effects you get from that medication over a few weeks and then you're fine on it. And cannabis is a lot more of a natural way to go about it than the chemical drugs that we get given in hospitals today. Main reason I'm telling you this is because in my eyes this needs to be taught to the highest members of the hospitals to, to then teach or show my video seminar on this matter to everyone under them and so forth as cannabis is available in all forms now and legally which has spread nationwide before I came in here, I was a 220, proud 222nd member of the Medical Cannabis Clinic in London, <coughs> which I believe was the first one. Then there were four, then 54. Now I believe there's over 80 in the whole of the um, United Kingdom, along with their dispensaries and pharmacies too. So, all in that. I be all of a sudden they've just popped up and <coughs> this I believe is all in an aid to help in fight fighting against Covid and to take people's mind off it too. I mean Theresa May's husband owns 90% of the ex um, can medical cannabis export of this country and he was waiting for Brexit but it's kind of pushed the government's um, plans forward and to keep people's <laughs> mind of COVID, they've bought, made it legally available available for people of certain <laughs> medical descriptions. So I will finish my seminar with a short video from Dr. Christine Sanchez explaining how cannabis works with cancer. But first, here's my story. To start again. The reason why I wanted to speak to yourselves is that I've quite a few poignant issues I thought the hospital could be brought up to speed with. As a su subject I'm wanting to discuss is something I'm having a problem with and experience myself that by me giving this sem seminar would help the whole hospital and nation's worth of hospitals understand where we stand now on certain medicines and the use of them and where we can use them. At the same time, giving hopefully an influential or inspirational talk about my journey in life and how I'm a walking miracle, miracle to still be hanging in there today. Yesterday and for as long as my fate will allow. So I start by telling you my story first and then hopefully I understand my reasons for wanting yeah to have a seminar for anyone as junior doctor and higher 
sorry, even to the d directors, ward sisters and matrons to pass on information on through what they would learn from me down to those beneath them. So by the end of it, the whole hospital will have heard my voice, an important message that needs teaching. I don't mind it being video recorded, hence this video recording now, for teaching purposes for the staff that work under them, i.e. the nurses, healthcare assistants and anyone else that works in the hospital, so everyone is aware that cannabis can now be used in medicine. So back in the year 2000, I was given, I was, sorry, I was 15 years old and I'd smoked cannabis since the age of 13, thinking that I was actually quite, un, for a long time in my life, unfortunate to start at that age. I remember that, it's, it's relevant later. Now, I was playing tennis one day and my foot slipped forward in my trainer and like a hernia, a lump popped out in between my little toe joint and then and my index toe and I was told I was fine but because uncomfortable I finally got them to remove it by the age of 17. <laughs> the doctor didn't get a second opinion though and told me it was non-cancerous so for two years he sent me to the physio with a Achilles strain that he was adamant it was as I had pain in my tibia area me and the physio and my mother weren't happy with this, so we pushed for a specialist foot doctor and finally got this in um, the winter of 2004. And um, so, being sent to a specialist in, at Stanmore Hospital in London, um, I seen this, this specialist foot doctor and he had told me that I had um, so back in the year 2000 I was 15 years old and had smoked cannabis since the age of 13 I always thought unfortunately now I remember that as that is relevant later I was playing tennis and my foot slipped forward in my trainer and like a hernia, a lump popped out in between my little toe joint and index toe. I was told it was fine, but because it was uncomfortable, I finally got, it removed, got them to remove it at 17 years old. The doctor didn't get a second opinion though, as, it, as he said he was adamant that it was non-malignant. For two years, he said I had an Achilles strain as I had pain in my tibia area. He just sent me to physio, whom on the first visit said they didn't think it was Achilles, but something else. But for two years carried on. But for two years, my family and I pushed for an appointment with a specialist foot doctor. During this time though, I completed an MVQ, MVQ 2, level two in Sheffern, at City College in Norwich, but spent a lot of time off through pain and out of the kitchen sitting on stools. Five months after finishing my course, I was able to get a job with a celebrity chef by, by the name of Brian Turner after going through a rigorous trials day in his kitchens, but got the job with Flying Colours. A week before starting, on Christmas Eve 2004, at the age of 19, I was admitted to the Teenage Cancer Trust Ward as my foot doctor at Stanmore Hospital had told me that the doctor two years previous hadn't asked for a second opinion and because of this, my cancer was missed as the doctor asked for the slide of this and he, once he looked at it, he could tell it was cancer straight away. No, sorry, it's, it's a bit um, raw for me and a bit emotional for me. Um, he done this, and as he done further, um, 
discoveries or found further discoveries in my body. He found seven, three skin, skin tumors on my right foot, four of my four, four bone tumors in my right foot, four bone, three bone tumors in my tibia, one bone tumor in my left knee, then hundreds of nodules of metacastic spread of um, the same cancer in my lungs. Of which I had a third of my left, yeah, a third of my left lung removed in 2005 to get rid of the worst of it. I was the seventh person in the world to have my skin cancer at that point, and the thirteenth person in the world to have my had had my bone and lung cancers. The other nineteen patients, unfortunately, though, died within eight eight weeks of contracting the, their cancer to dying, and theirs all started in their hands, whereas mine all started in my foot. So I'm the only person in the world to have at start in my foot but to also be a very a hold of a very rare cancer um you, you i was being treated at the uclh hospital in london under the care of Jurassic professor jeremy whelan who to me is the best doctor of rare ca oncologist of uh, rare cancers in the whole world um, and it was there I was treated for my cancer on the Teenage Cancer Trust Ward. Even though I was 19, they felt it would be nicer for me in there, and to be honest, it was. They had everything you could think of to keep your mind off of your cancer, and can't thank them and all the doctors involved in keeping me alive enough or ever be able to show them how truly grateful I am to them for all keeping me alive even still today and through that through doing this i hope i'm doing that i was meant to have six bouts against the awful chemo and radiotherapy as they call it the treatment that i wouldn't even wish on my enemies but i was stopped after five rounds in the theoretical ring as i was being ko'd i was being burned from, and killed from the inside out after the fifth bout, I had to go to see my doctor and I was told that I had six weeks left to live, unfortunately. So this is May of 2005. In that first week, I had to travel between Ipswich and London to have scans. And I was told to come on the Friday to come back and on the Monday. On the Saturday, I was, myself and my mum and my dad were called in I am urgently, and we got there <laughs> late that day, even though we were expecting to be there the Monday. When we got there, the first question that was asked by my usual um, eccentric Professor Whelan was, what the hell had I done in the last week? And it was quite a sombre affair at that moment in the room. Um, and he meant in the kind of lifestyle choices, um, as it looked, as he said, it looked at now instead of five to six weeks, he was hoping to tell me that I had two to three weeks left to live. Now, that's not what we were expecting. He said, look, have you started eating anything different? Smoking something different? Drugs, whatever. So I was honest. I said, I've given up cigarettes. All of a sudden, he started laughing. He said, for goodness sake, James, you could have gone away and done anything you wanted, like, and live, just lived your dreams, and you choose to give up cigarettes. You could have smoked them. You, you had weeks left to live, you silly sod. And sort of, we all started to have a laugh, even though I was just told I had two to three weeks left to live. And then he asked, he, he said again, what is it you've done? What is, what is it that you've there's got to be something that you've changed. I said, look, I've told you, I've given up smoking. I've given up smoking can, and that's when he stopped me. He said, please don't tell me that you've given up smoking cannabis. And I said, well, 
Yeah, there's, there's um, well, it's, I mean, as soon as I met the world, he came out of it. Um, and um, he, he said, um, I, I said, yeah, I said, well, after a lot of thinking and looking up at each time, you had chemo, chemo and radiotherapy, your cancer would spike as in the three days, not the three weeks that you were meant to be in here, because we thought you were being a, a bit of an ass and discharging yourself after three days, thinking that you had been in there for three weeks, but you were going home. We know, we have now seen that when you were in cancer, at uh, men here having the treatment for your cancer through the chemo, your cancer would go through the roof. The three weeks you've been at home smoking cannabis, um, we noticed that your cancer would flatline. You would come in and have treatment, it would go up. He'd go home at flatline and so on and so forth. And he said, because I'd smoked cannabis since the age of 13, and my cancer started at the age of 15, I wasn't unfortunately smoking it from that age. I now was fortunate to have been smoking it from that age in his eyes. Um, and by the age of 15, I was already keeping my cancer back. So he asked me to go home and research a doctor called Dr. Christian Sanchez. Now, amazing work with cancer and cannabis in the early 90s and the findings of a system in our brain, like I've said, called the endocannabinoid system. I'm lucky enough to know a doctor that went over to work with this amazing microbiologist for three years and brought his amazing learning back he had helped people like myself with cannabis oils, CBD and THC alike, um, and different tinctures for different types of cancer and other known illnesses, diseases and addictions, like coming off of oral morph and when coming out of hospital, like I'm going to need doing when I come out. I went home after my doctor had told me to go home and never to reveal it until it was medically um allowed in the country that he had said this and I can so I can now hand on my heart say it that I was told by my doctor to go home and smoke as much cannabis as I could in that next week. I had two to three weeks left, what harm is there in trying? So I went home and smoked as much as I could in that first week. We went back a week later and we walked into the room and all my doctor done was slammed his fist into his hand and said, by Jove, I knew it. And I said, what, what do you know? He said, your cancer looks like it's completely stopped in its tracks. Now, needless to say, but I've smoked cannabis from that day ever since. He did laugh and have a joke with me saying he doubt he'd seen me in my 30s still, but I'm now 35 and I'm still seeing him and he's absolutely amazed that cannabis has saved my life. The most any of my tum original tumours have grown from 2005 till now is by two millimetres and all down to cannabis. Although it hasn't killed it, it has stored it for two decades now, giving me three beautiful boys, even though I was told I was infertile, they're now my young Suffolk young carers, 8, 10 and 13 years old. And unfortunately, their mother cheated over the Christmas of 2016 and left the four of us on January 2nd, 2017. But what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, I hope. And I've managed to learn that. She only gets to sit... She only, through her choice and, and work, she only sees them every other weekend. And I have them full time. Now, it kills me, but they're my orphan and I wouldn't have it any other way. They are my world. Adding already to the masses of willpower of a mass from the start. Um, they just give me the willpower to go on. Even though I've got the Joker card in life, I believe, 
I'm still living, but seemingly falling apart. I'm op I'm still optimistic, but I'm also realistic, as I won't let my cancer take me. Yet, although I've found out of the second type of lung cancer in October of 2019, which is being removed on the 16th of this month, which I'm very happy about. My children will be happy too, because all through my children's lives, even though I've been depleting more over the last few years, I would say, I still try to be the best dad I can and show them you can try your hand at anything in life, within your limits, of course and definitely within mine, and try and make a living through working whilst also smiling through adversity and pain. The point of my seminar is to inform the main staff mentioned at the start of this video seminar that there are now over 50 plus medical ca cannabis clinics that have been allowed to open earlier than Brexit was going to allow. Now, They've done this to take people's minds off coronavirus, but they haven't notified the hospitals. So that is why I feel it is my job to notify you that, that you're going to have an influx of patients, as I've said, who have a prescribed, legally prescribed medical cannabis prescription, including cannabis you can smoke, like my smoke self, which is what I've needed and wanted to happen since 2005. I'm currently writing this from within the hospital as an inpatient on curtain ward for now as on top of my cancer I screwed up back from stenosis of the spine um, I've also lost the use of my left hand side of my body and I have foot and leg drop in my left leg as well which I've had since October of 2017 so as well as the numbness all down my body, I've had been fighting for chest infections since October. For the first week I was in here, nurses would take me out to smoke a joint outside under the bike sheds when needed to take my 0 0.5 four, four times throughout the day, as agreed with my private doctor that I paid through my teeth for. So a lot of different nurses ended up taking me to smoke on site and had already an agreement with security as I showed my prescription to them. I was then, after a week, sat in a side room with, a, with my sister not allowed to enter with two security guards on guard-like duty but shaking their heads in disbelief at what I was being told. One of the nurses in the appointment was one who took me out on one occasion but because the matron of the hospital was bearing down on me, she lied and said she didn't even know that I had it on the ward. I made a point of telling everyone on there, including the two ward sisters, who were also in the meeting, that I was going to have a joint or some cannabis, or on more than one occasion, they lied to, denying knowing anything about it. So I thought to do my bit to help the hospital better understand prescription cannabis as you will start, like I say, getting more patients coming in that have been prescribed medical cannabis and I don't want them to go through the hell I've had to endure for my seventh day in here after being admitted on the 3rd of August. As I've been told to hide my legally prescribed cannabis off of hospital grounds, where if found by someone, could get me in a lot of trouble with the police, or could or could to get someone to drive forty mile round trip four times a day to me, just to bring me a ready roll joint. Meaning, if they get pulled over by the police and that's found in their possession, they would be more than likely be arrested or lose their license because the hospital will not let me have my prescription on the ward and I have to hide it off of the ward even though I'm allowed half an ounce of cannabis cooked in butter in my bedside unit. I think that's all the points I've hopefully covered and hope for other patients sakes and for mine 
in the future too, as I'm more of a regular here than my local pub, <laughs> that they and I get the medical recognition that cannabis is another medication and I shouldn't be forced off-site to hide and smoke a prescription drug while I'm in a wheelchair and I've been chased in through the gates to a hospital three times now by five adults around my age on bikes at night trying to mug me after I've hidden it so I'd have been stabbed or beaten up for nothing. I also wrote a poem that works within the hospital that don't get the praise they deserve. My sixth point. So to finish off, here's my poem I wrote whilst in hospital in 2018. Say thank you to all the unappreciated staff that work like bees here. So here is To the Unsung Heroes by me, James Bevan. Nurses come and nurses go. Working long shift, caring is just in their flow. They're all of different nationality, race or creed. They all share one thing though, caring for all those that are most in need. Switch over and hand over, they're ready for anything, just as long as their comrades before them tell them what's happening. Doctors you rarely see, but their attentiveness is there to see. But if it wasn't for the nurses with their health care, where would we be? Even my surgery pharmacist assists me more than my general GP. Just with doctors, I'll tell you, we'll be up Beep Creek. They are the start, but can't take you to the finish line. That's left to the doctor's minions, who take none of the credit for keeping people alive. The nurses, healthcare assistants, cleaners and anyone else involved, down to the ladies stirring my coffee so well. They all tend to different needs. Without them, I believe, we'd be in up to our knees. They come along and change your bed, not caring for sick, or even if you've bleep, or even if you've bled. They do their duty, and they do it with pride. They staff are priceless, and they do the best they can. Don't take the mick for a roundabout ride. So it's here it for the forgotten, and how they take care of your future. Whilst they care for you, remember their sweet nature. Whether in not, in agony or seething pain, they're there to soothe you and care for you, come shine or rain. Long shifts, double shifts, hours numb in their brains. I don't know how they do it, but I'm thankful they work as hard as the biggest cranes. Just greatness in completely different ways. That's by me, James Bevan. Now... The end of cannabinoid, I know I'd said I'd finished, but I'd like to explain a little bit about the endocannabinoid system. Now, in my words, it's something I've added. Hopefully better professionally explained afterwards than I. Information I found in more simplistic form as possible on the internet for your own reading and also a bit about the amazing Dr. Christine Sanchez whose work is only now starting to do good for our nation, now 28 years behind. Imagine where we would be in medical advancements by now if we had just listened to her then and others as well, if only. Would have saved many a life without horrible chemo, rather than the mellow chemo cannabis naturally gives. So please pass this seminar or teachings on to every member in every sector of the hospital so that all members of staff are aware of how of the now legal use of medical cannabis and hopefully others won't be pushed out into danger to hide and smoke their cannabis if that is the way that helps them. Smoking it helps me more as is a quick release whereas oils and eating it are of slow release with my pain, I need the quick release, for instance, so 30 mils of oil morph just doesn't do it. 
I'm hoping through this I've given you all a better understanding of the medicinal use of cannabis and hopefully will change the hospital rules around us. That concludes the main points I wanted to teach or preach but felt it's an important subject to do so. But below there are some more independent explanations of the endocannabinoid system and Dr. Christian Sanchez's Wikipedia. For the purpose of this video seminar, I will read them out. Um, also, if you search for her on YouTube, just search Dr. Christian Sanchez and her work with cannabis and cancer and a multitude of videos come up. If there are any further questions, then please don't hesitate to call me to hopefully answer any questions at all. Thank you for your time. My name's been James Bevan, and you can reach me at kaitizer at gmail.com. That's K for kilo, A for alpha, I for indigo, T for tango, I for indigo, Z for Zulu, E for echo, R for Romeo, 123 at gmail.com. Or on my mobile, 07922-589-875. Now, this next little bit of information is from he healthline.com and medically reviewed by Alan Carter, Farm D, written by Crystal Raypole on May 17th, 2019. A simple guide of the endocannabinoid or EC system and how it works. The endocannabinoid system is a complex cell signaling system identified in the early 1990s by researchers exploring THC, a well-known cannabinoid. Cannabinoids are compounds found in cannabis. Experts are still trying to fully understand the ECS, but so far we know it plays a role in regulating a range of functions and processes, including 1. Sleep 2. Mood Three, appetite. Four, memory. And five, reproduction and fertility. The ECS exists and is active in your body even if you don't use cannabis. So it's in every person's body on this known planet. So how does it work? The ECS involves three core components. Endocannabinoids, receptors and enzymes. Endocannabinoids, also called endogenous cannabinoids, are molecules made by your body. They're similar to cannabinoids, but they're produced by your body. Experts have identified two endo key endocannabinoids so far. Anadamide, AEA for sure, or 2 slash Arachnid onoyl which is spelled arachnid o n o y l g l y e r o l, or in brackets two dash a g. These help keep internal functions running smoothly. Your body produces them as needed, making it difficult to know what typical levels are for each. Now, endocannabinoid receptors. These receptors are found throughout your body. Endocannabinoids bind to them in order to signal that the ECS needs to take action. There are two main endocannabinoid receptors. One is the CB1 receptor, which are mostly receptors which are mostly found in the central nervous system and to the CB2 receptors, which is, are mostly found in your peripheral nervous system, especially in your immune cells. Endocannabinoids can bind to either receptor. The effects that result depend on where the receptor is located and which endocannabinoid it binds to. For example, endocamb endocannabinoids might target CB1 receptors in a spinal nerve, 
to relieve pain. Others might bind to a CB2, CB2 receptor in your immune cells to signal that your body's experienced inflammation, a common sign of autoimmune disorders. Now enzymes. Enzymes are responsible for breaking down endocannabinoids once they've carried out their function. There are two main enzymes responsible for this. Fat, one being fatty acid amide hydrolase, which breaks down AEA. And then monoglyceryl acid lipase, which typically breaks down 2-AG. So what are its functions? The ECS is complicated and experts haven't yet determined exactly how it works or all of its potential functions. Research trust, trusted source has linked the ECS to the following processes. Appetite and digestion, metabolism, chronic pain, Inflammation and other infl immune system responses. Mood. Learning and memory. Motor control. Sleep. Cardiovascular system function. Muscle formation. Bone remodeling and growth. Liver function. Reproductive system function. Stress. Skin and nerve function. These functions all contribute to homeostasis, which refers to stability of your internal environment. For example, if an outside force, such as pain from an injury or fever, throws off your body's homeostasis, your ECS kicks in to help your body return to its ideal operation. Today, experts believe that by Maintaining homeostasis is the primary role of the ECS. So how does THC interact with the ECS? Tetrahydrocannabinol THC, is one of the main cannabinoids found in cannabis. It's a compound that gets you high. Once in your body, THC interacts with the ECS by binding to receptors just like endocannabinoids. It's powerful partly because it can bind to both CB1 and CB2 receptors. This allows it to have a range of effects on your body and mind, some more desirable than others, as I stated earlier. For example, THC may help to reduce pain and stimulate your appetite, but it can also cause paranoia and anxiety in some cases, but that's when you need to build a tolerance up to your own level. Experts are currently looking into ways to produce synthetic THC cannabinoids that interact with the ECS in only beneficial ways. So how does CBD interact with the ECS? The other major cannabinoid found in cannabis is cannabidiol CBD. Unlike THC, CBD doesn't make you high and typically doesn't cause any negative effects. Experts aren't completely sure how CBD interacts with the ECS, but they do know that it doesn't bind to CB1 or CB2 receptors the way that THC does. Instead, many beliefs believe it works by preventing endocannabinoids from being broken down. This allows them to have more of an effect on your body. Others believe that CBD binds to a receptor that hasn't even been dis discovered yet. While well, details of how it works are still under debate, research suggests that CBD can help with pain, nausea and other symptoms associated with multiple conditions. What about endocannabinoid deficiency? Some experts believe in a theory known as a clinical endocannabinoid deficiency, CECD. This theory suggests that low endocannabinoid levels in your body 
or ECS dysfunction can contribute to the development of certain conditions. In 2016, an article trusted source reviewing over 10 years of research on the subject suggests a theory could explain why some people develop migraines, fibromyalgia and irritable bowel syndrome. None of these conditions have a clear underlying cause. They're also often resistant to treatment and sometimes occur alongside each other. If CEC neural in these conditions, targeting the ECS or endocannabinoid production could be the missing key to treatment, but more research is needed, which is the bottom line. The ECS plays a big role in keeping your internal processes stable, but there's still a lot we don't know about it. As experts develop a better understanding of the ECS, it could eventually hold the key to treating several conditions. And that was last medic review reviewed on May the 17th in 2019. Now, this next bit is Dr. Christine, about Christine, Dr. Christine Sanchez's um, profession explained and her workings in short term. My source is Wikipedia. So Dr. Christina Sanchez is a Spanish molecular biologist. She was born in Madrid in Spain in 1971. She graduated from biology at the Complutense, University of Madrid in 1994. She obtained her PhD with honours in biochemistry and molecular biology at Complutense University in 2000 and went into postdoc studying the antitumoral and other properties of medical cannabis, especially cancer and the therapeutic qualities of cannabinoids. She has been vocal about popularising the healing opotic effect of cannabinoids on cannabinoid receptor containing cancer cells while leaving the healthy cannabinoid receptor, receptor containing cells be. So, that concludes my well, not so short sem video seminar, and I hope you've all learned what I've hoped to teach you all, and I wish you all a good life. Thank you.